Hello, thank you so much for this uh, kind invitation uh, to this extraordinary event of, uh, for sharing experiences and practices. Uh, since I feel a little bit out of my element being an architect and you being mainly uh, designers, product designers and industrial designers, I decided to start by clarifying a few concepts so that we are uh, on the same page uh, while going through the presentation. So particularly these two ones, by design, what we do uh, is uh, use form in a strategic way, since we think that form is a very powerful tool to, to synthesize complexity without simplifying it. The strategic use of form allows to give simple answers without being reductive. So uh, it's, that's what we think it's necessary for going beyond diagnosis into implementation and not having then afterwards things to regret. Second, creativity. It's what you do when there is not enough available knowledge to answer a question. With sufficient knowledge, there's no need to be creative. So creativity, I was asked this yesterday in an interview, will, if creativity will change the world. No. Uh, because it's because the world is changing that we need to be creative. There are new questions out there. For those questions, sometimes there are not enough knowledge, and therefore, as a consequence, we have to be creative. So creativity, uh, we think it's never a goal in itself, just what we need to do if uh, we're unable to provide appropriate answers to the new questions that are constantly uh, arising throughout the world. To go through this, I'm going to present here today two things. One kind of introduction of works of a more conventional kind of practice. I do, uh, like say, buildings, uh, which is where we think we get trained uh, our design skills to then apply in social housing, which is the toughest of the questions. So how do we know this kind of more normal architectural practice where we are asked to work at a certain cutting edge or uh, trying to produce state-of-the-art state buildings, uh, we would have not been training our muscles uh, appropriately to run the real difficult race of doing social housing and that type of uh, uh, architecture. That is a, it's a, a different, a, requires a different approach. So first part, very quickly, not even going into the projects, a set of practices and, and buildings we've been doing lately. Uh, and then those design skills go directly into where I'm going to focus uh, more intensively, which is the elemental uh, part of the presentation. Both approaches, though, share the same uh, idea. Uh, and I think it might be a close thing to you since you're mainly designers, and I guess you more than I uh, more frequently ask to design a chair. <clears throat> so I've been using this introduction <clears throat> quite often since I think it represents still very well uh, the way we like to understand our practice. So imagine we're asked to design a chair. When we thought that the most simple possible chair is this one, I saw this one. Three things can be said about that chair. First, this Indian from Paraguay is so poor that he cannot afford anything but a modest piece of cloth as a chair. So to design and to know how to design under scarcity of means is relevant. Second, even if this man had more money, other type of design would be useless because this man is, is a nomad. So design has to be precise. Finally, this design represents a kind of ultimate limit because you cannot keep taking things out of this design. What you remain with is just the verb to sit. And I think our practice stops at the very limit where you still have a noun, in this case, chair. So before becoming a pure verb to sit, we have to learn how to make designs that are irreducible. Our practice can be explained by the following equation. That design 
uh, of a chair of the Indian is to the conventional chair that we think as is X is to architecture. Our task is to find the most relevant, precise, and irreducible value for X. With that in mind, we have been doing, as I said, these more conventional buildings. My first building uh, back in 1998 for the mathematics school in Santiago. Where we were trying to use copper, which is a major product in Chile, in a cheap way for buildings since copper is maintenance free and that type of approach makes sense for institutions uh, that had a huge amount of uh, uh, buildings to maintain. Since we were on budget, we were asked to do another building for the university, the medical school. Uh, in this case, our building material was uh, even cheaper, was shadow. We were trying to capture all those situations that due to the Santiago weather are highly desirable. How to host people within the facade creating these shadow buildings. For the library underneath, the problem was just the opposite, was the search of light. Then we were asked again, uh, with questions of budget to do uh, the architecture school building, uh, and we were given a thousand runs per square meter, 120, even less, uh, 800 runs per square meter, and three months. Uh, so, using fruit packing technology, we were able to put together uh, this building within budget. We then went on to another problem. The client wanted uh, a glass tower for computers in the university. Uh, it was, uh, again, uh, not that much budget, and we decided to break uh, the complexity of the problem into smaller, more simple problems, trying to have materials doing one thing efficiently at a time. So different layers of skin uh, to ask glass what was is good for doing for, and then another building inside to prevent greenhouse effect and allow hot air to go up be accelerated by the wastes of the building uh, in a kind of vertical chimney and leave the system before reaching the second uh, is what we are trying to achieve in here. This is our first project outside Chile uh, in Austin, Texas, dormitories for a university. Uh, the weather in this case was extremely tough uh, and again, hand labor, Mexican hand labor mainly, that we already in intuitively knew we're going to be building the, the entire complex. Uh, so we took all that low-tech hand skills of masons from Mexico uh, to create the outer skin, resistance, uh, resistant against the weather. And then in the interior, uh, we carved a more uh, gentle environment where glass was and where all the most uh, common and transparent activities of studios were hosted uh, within the dorms. That began a series of projects outside Chile, uh, this one in Mexico, still under construction mainly for creating shadows and cross-ventilation for pilgrims uh, that use this route throughout Mexico. Very few houses. Uh, actually, this is one of the two we've done. Uh, but then we have been, have been asked to do uh, more houses. Again, I think it's an extremely difficult theme uh, and uh, we like the kind of muscles you exercise while doing private houses, even for wealthy clients. Uh, this is a project in uh, part of the Ordos 100 initiative in Inner Mongolia. It's an extremely recent project that we're developing. Actually, on my way to South Africa, I had a, a meeting with the client uh, at the airport in Sao Paulo. 
uh, for uh, discussing this house. This is a project for a company that has been named here several times, Vitra, in the Weilam Rhine campus. Uh, that uh, we began in 2008, but are not sure when it's going to be it's going to continue due to the crisis. Still, uh, um, again, the, the name of Rolf Feldbaum is uh, somebody that I know that in the end of my life I will have to thank a lot. Uh, very key person to how to uh, improve your practice. This is a project. Uh, we're, we've been developing intensively in a winery in Germany for uh, a premium wine, a Riesling, white wine. On the Rhine River, uh, and we're using gravity uh, to keep the tannin, tannins intact uh, throughout the process to get this, uh, uh, this premium wine. Project for a museum, competition that we lost in Colombia. So, and that's the more conventional part of the practice. Everything we do there, it's absolutely necessary because design is required if you want to deal with this type of tough new challenges. Uh, namely, the, the world going to town, the, the process of urbanization of the, of the world. Uh, there's a uh, London School of Economics uh, and Deutsche Bank Urban Age Initiative in the, in the same cover explains back in 1900, 10% of the population of the world lived in cities. The more people we have moving towards cities, the better. And it's expected to become a huge trend in the world because by 2050, 70% of the population of the world should be living in cities. This is excellent news for both ends of the pyramid. <clears throat> On the one hand, for a certain elite, as you are here, <clears throat> or as, as we all are, because we're knowledge creators, that requires, as one of the conditions, face-to-face -face contacts. So you go where there's critical mass, and that happens in cities. That's the importance, actually, of this event. I mean, much of the things that you come back with, uh, at least in my case, comes from the, all the interaction that happens in between and do, during the presentations. So having cities is the best way to improve knowledge creation, <clears throat> and the more people uh, go to cities, the more critical mass we are going to have, and that knowledge creation is got, going to move economies in the global future. But simultaneously, for the bottom of the pyramid, uh, cities are a shortcut towards equality you don't have to wait for income redistribution for upgrade quality of life of the poor. So again, cities are extremely efficient, an extremely efficient tool to achieve that. The scale and speed of this process of people moving towards cities. If now we have three billion people living in cities and one billion is under the line of poverty, by 2030, that is tomorrow, we're going to have five billion people living in cities and two billion are going to be living under the line of poverty. The process of migration towards cities is going to happen in between the tropics, in the poorest countries in the world. So, expressed as an equation, we, the type of knowledge that we need is that, that enables to create a one million people city per week with $10,000 per family for the next 20 years. And for solving that equation, there's not enough knowledge. Therefore, we need to be creative. What we're trying to do, instead of discuss, that's why we call our practice a do tank, is to try to identify projects, infrastructural projects, public space, public transport, and housing, and I'm going to talk today only about housing, that can perform for both ends to attract creative professionals that are going to create wealth, which is going to be moving economies forward, simultaneously identify strategic projects that can upgrade quality of life for poor people without having to wait for income redistribution. So, talking about housing, just two points 
that I would like to highlight. If you have money, if, let's say if you are from a middle income standard or uh, above, there's no problem. The market know, know how to provide you housing solution. In average, in the world, we're talking about 80 square meters. But what if there's not money? What the market does is to take the middle income standard house of 80 square meters and squeeze it until it can pay with the available amount of money, be it a subsidy, uh, family uh, savings, or whatever it is. So what the market produces is a small, in average, 40 square meter house. And our first point was, what if, instead of thinking of 40 square meters as a small house, we think that 40 square meters is half of a good house? When you reframe the question as 40 square meters, as half of a good house, the key question is, which half do we do? And we thought it was strategic, and therefore design comes into play and form into play. It was strategic to do the half that a family will never be able to achieve on its own. We identified five desired conditions that families very difficultly are going to be able to improve over time. Just to mention one, location. Once you get a house in the outskirts, far away in a ghetto, away from opportunities that cities concentrate, no matter how much time, energy you spend in your own household, you will never going to be able to change that location. For poor people, location is crucial. So, just to give an example, the key questions to answer while doing social housing is not how many square meters you are providing, how many finishings you are provi providing. It's not the quantity. The key question is where? Where is social housing? Problem? Land. Land is a scarce resource and it's expensive. So is there a way by which design can, within the same amount, modest amount of a subsidy, let's say of $10,000, is able to provide better locations without sacrificing the quality of the household. So this is the type of uh, points that we have been looking for. But the point is half of a good house instead of a small home. The second one is that well, houses should be just the opposite of a car in the sense that they should gain value over time. And that is not the case for social housing. Every day that goes by, you will find that the amount of the cost, the direct cost of the household, $10,000 or whatever it is, you go then into the market and want to buy one of those, they tend to cost nothing. I mean, because they are in parts of the city that worth nothing, the material quality is extremely poor. And normally, housing subsidies or housing policies is by far the biggest aid families, poor families get from the state. So it would be desirable to use that, that amount of money in a way that it could be called an investment and not a mere social expense. So can we design in a way that, I mean, all of us when buying a house expect it to gain value over time. Why not do the same thing for social housing? I mean, if we're going to follow the capitalistic approach, well, let's apply capitalism to everybody. And capitalism is mainly about having properties, living and in an asset, live a parallel life as capital. If a poor family receives an aid from the state, let's say, in the form of a housing unit, and that family is able to get something that gains value over time, then that family can go to the bank and ask for a loan for a, running a small business, a sewing machine, a cab, or whatever. And this is extremely important if you want to break the poverty uh, chain. Uh, and therefore, we identified a set of design conditions that can expect, that with, through which we can expect households for the poor can gain value over time, exactly the same way we all us expect for our own homes. Back in 2003, we were asked by the Chilean government for two years at Harvard University, um, we tried to cr cr develop some knowledge. I mean, back in 2000, when I was invited to teach at Harvard for the first time, I had no idea what a subsidy was. 
So for two years, I was, we all were trying to upgrade. And when I say we, it's specifically me. And the, at the beginning, my partner, who is a transport engineer, was making his master's at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, Harvard Andres Jacobelli. We were trying to swallow as much information as possible uh, to be able to deal with a real difficult question, which was the one of social housing. After two years, we thought we, have a point, we had a point, and we tried to communicate that to the government, to the state, actually. And uh, we were asked to solve this problem. Can you, with what you, have, what you think you have as a solution, provide a house, housing project for 100 families with that subsidy at the time was $7,500 with, this is 50,000 rands, more or less, with which you have to buy the land, provide the infrastructure, and build the house. Uh, that amount of money, in the best of the cases, allows you to build around 30 square meters. So if you can keep the families where they have been for 30 years illegally occupying a site of half an hectare, 5,000 square meters, within that set of constraints, then you get the project. This is how this place looked like back in 2003. And I guess you can recognize these conditions. This is pretty much universal uh, from shanty towns uh, and townships, it's called here, in, uh, in the outskirts of, of the cities. Uh, this were the living conditions, extremely bad living conditions, tough drug dealing problems associated to this kind of uh, labyrinthic uh, layout. Even though everything was extremely bad, the city around in here was highly desirable to be maintained because there, it was in the city center, it was an illegal settlement in the center. The sol normal solution would be, well, let's expel the poor where all the poor are, somewhere in the periphery, in the periphery where land costs nothing. Well, the government asked us, can you provide a solution within, within the same site? Because the city around is where these families have their jobs, where their children go to schools, where healthcare is better than in the periphery, where transportation is, they're four blocks away from the beach. So from every single point of view, it's highly desirable, socially, economically, politically speaking, to keep the families there. Can you do that? The problem is that the cost of the land and the market pretty much identified that concentration of opportunities around this spot. The cost of the land around was three times more expensive than what socially, social housing can normally afford. Besides that, we were told by the experts that don't even dare to think of any other solution that uh, an individual house, families will, will only accept a house as a solution. Any other thing, it's unthinkable. So we began a series of uh, workshops with the families Participation for us meant more than asking the question, how would you like your house? It's mainly about information and communication of, of constraints. Can we have the families understand the set of restrictions that we're working with so they can be part, if we have to give priorities to things because we are not going to be able to give everything, but if we have to establish priorities, don't, aren't the families themselves the ones that know better what is more important to them and what has to be given at first and then what will be then left for themselves to be built afterwards. So we began a, set, a series of workshops informating and communicating constraints. This PowerPoint is exactly the same one, just not in English, of course, that we showed to the families. And we made this, the following exercise, going back to the question of creativity. If there's a solution out there in the market, well, why to be creative? Let's try to test if such a thing is out there. So individual units, or in this case, they share uh, one partition wall, but still individual, one family, one lot. Well, that approach allowed us to build only 30 units within the site. So 30 families had to decide, to decide uh, that they had to leave. That was not, not, was not only a social problem, but also, if we put together the subsidies of 30 families, we were not even able to buy the land. So there's the need 
for more families to even make the commercial operation for, of buying more expensive, well-located land in the city. But imagine we were given the site by a philanthropist or something like that. Well, individual units within the lot are unable to manage the second half of the house, and we were working in a niche where at least 50% of the square meters were going to be self-built, so a complete uncertainty for the second half of the house. Actually, somewhere in this picture you see the roofs of those solutions that were swallowed by self-construction, and what you get in the end is a neighborhood that works as nothing at the original squatter used to be. And one of the points is value gain. So families pretty soon understood that this was not a solution. Well, let's test this other typology, row houses, that is available out there in the market as well. <clears throat> in this case, the market, trying to make a more efficient use of land, has reduced the width of the lot until making it coincident with the width of the house. And furthermore, coincident with the width of the room. We're talking about three meter wide houses. That means that whenever you want to add a room, and we're working again in a, in a niche where half of the rooms were had to be added afterwards. Whenever you add a room, you have to go through the previous room, which has problems of privacy, or you block bathrooms and kitchens, which in the end, more than efficiency in the land use, creates overcrowding. Still not enough, just 60 units with this typology. So that was not a solution either. So let's go for the third typology available in the market, high rises, tall buildings. Will families threaten to go to hunger strike if we even dare to give this as a solution? And they were right because these buildings do not allow for expansions and working with 30 something square meters, it's impossible for them to add that second half. In, a, in an individual unit, no matter how bad you can do it, at least you get those extra square meters. Well, in this case, it's, that's even uh, difficult, even though we were able to host all the families. So that was not a solution. We had to reframe the question. And again, so there's not enough problem. Here it comes. How you come up with a solution that is creative in the sense that we've been talking about? Well, maybe we were framing the problem in the wrong direction. Uh, because we were looking for $7,000 units to be multiplied 100 times. And we asked ourselves, well, what if we look for the best $700 thousand dollar building and we ask conditions to the building to host the hundred families and to host their expansions. The problem with that is with that buildings, as we just saw, do not allow for expansions. That's true, just not in the ground floor and in the upper floor, because ground floor can always expand horizontally and the last floor can always expand vertically into the air. So what we did was a building that only had the ground and the last floor. We moved it across the lot in such a way that we covered at least 50% of the urban front so that we could guarantee a certain percentage of the urban quality in the future, but also that in that way, producing voids within the structure, we were providing the structure for the second half that was about to come. Structure belong, belongs to those things that families individually will never be able to do decently on their own. It needs a proper uh, engineer and calculation. It needs to be safe. So uh, we designed that kind of porous strategy of parallel properties, a house underneath and an apartment on top with direct access to the public space. Another, there's enough evidence out there in the world to, to know that common spaces in poor environment are not maintained. So the typical high-rise solution with shared corridors and elevators that nobody pays for are the infamous ghettos that we have been uh, demolished everywhere in the world. So one of the conditions for uh, this uh, typology is do not have shared common space to access second level properties. In the voids, we expected uh, self-growth and self-construction to happen. This is uh, my partner, uh, 
once we thought we had a point, again, we went to the families to try to explain this approach. Uh, just a, a remarkable side note. Uh, exactly seven days ago, uh, last Friday, he was appointed Vice Minister of Housing of Chile. So we think we're finally going from things uh, <laughs> from things to policies, which is normally the other way around. You expect to have perfect policies and then implement them. Uh, I guess this time uh, it took us almost nine years uh, to go the other way around. Still, at that time, we were trying to use every single available tool we as architects have uh, to communicate with the families uh, what this project was about. Trying to use uh, models to explain how and which rules uh, for growing uh, and for shared property was going to be like. Binary, simple rules, yes and no. And every, every gray is out of the questions, too complicated, too many meetings. We ask every uh, family leader uh, to write and draw uh, about the project because we wanted to verify if we were on the same page. So in this case, we asked them to draw uh, what they thought the project was going to be like, uh, or the facades, or the growth, always in the last place why I would like it to happen, <laughs> or the courtyards. And this is how they imagined uh, the project was going to look like. We were competing in the market against this. With $7,000, what you get is a 36 six by six uh, box in the periphery, you know, 45 minutes away, where land costs as little as possible so that you can pay for that land with the subsidy. And we had to prove that we were able, with the same amount of money, do this in the city center where land costs three times more. As you see, design is not in the box. It's the same shitty box that you saw in the competence. <laughs> it's just placed in such a way, one underneath and one on top, so that we can gain enough density without overcrowding with possibility of expansion. If we were able to keep the families where they were, and these families keep their jobs, for example, we knew these families were going to be able to very quickly do the second half, and uh, eventually, uh, in the second half, uh, go for the Martha Stewart kind of uh, living. In a way, it's, it's fair since we very consciously are uh, boring, monotonous, repetitive, hard and dry with the first half in the sense that we were not trying to think of design of making more pretty the first half. Actually, if we're very monotonous with the first half, it might be the only way to control completely, let's say, expressive second halves uh, of houses and create some sort of a neutral frame for that second half to perform as a process of customization instead of process of deterioration of the uh, urban uh, layout. Cost of the first half, the one that we took responsibility for, for with public funds, $7,000. In average, the cost of the next 36 square meters, $1,000. One of the reasons we are doing the structure you know, in a building like this, 20 to 30 percent of the cost is the structure, 70 percent is the finishings. When you go to social housing, that proportion is reversed. About 80 percent of the cost is the structure. So it's mainly about structure. Uh, then the second half, uh, the finishings uh, are just 20 percent. Since we were doing the structure for the final scenario, not for the first 36 square meters, but for the final 72 square meters, then families, while doing their own 36 square meters, were just looking for that 20% of the cost. And that explains pretty much 
the value in average for that extra room that families need. Bank have uh, measured the value of the property uh, after one and a half years or so that was the, which were delivered to families in 2004 in $20,000. And that broke uh, a, t a trend of the, of the market of social housing policy uh, so that now families can go to the bank. <laughs> so talking about priorities and participation, with the families we had to agree that, as you see, no payments, no paint. I mean, you are pretty much flesh to be on the media, on the news. How is it possible that we're giving such a solution to the poor? It's, it's not really what they deserve, no, nothing in here. Families themselves agreed that it was much more important that we spent the money on structure or on land than on finishing because painting, pavements and all that stuff it's relatively easy for them to do on their own and definitely some things they want to do on themselves. They know better than us what they want. And we, we would never possibly uh, guess that the interior was going to look like this. For the duplex units on top, We just concentrate on specific issues about design, like the DNA of the design has to be of middle income standard. That means for the bathroom, not a shower, but a bathtub. I mean, that makes the difference. To change the standard of the bathroom, uh, of course, uh, with families, we had to agree, okay, if we go, want to go for a better bathroom, the, the one you would get if you had more money, well, there's, there are things that we are not going to be able to provide to you. So you choose what you don't want to be able to have this that is a priority. So, for example, there was normally the question to the families what to do, uh, water heater or bathtub. Because sometimes you have the, the connections to the bathtub, but just the shower, but at least you just then replace the artifact. So you can't do both. But even though you can't provide all the connections on the shower place, if families decide to do so, well, bathtub or water heater, we can't have both. What do you think families choose while having to choose between water heater and bathtub? How much would you go for the, for the water heater? How many of you bathtub? Well, when we asked families, 100% chose bathtub. The reason, they've been uh, shower, taking showers and bathing in the courtyard with cans. Uh, so cold water is not an issue. They're kind of used to that. Privacy is an issue. But more, that, more than that, the bathtub means that you're able to give a bath to a child that you're able to wash clothes, for example. Uh, but even more, the real reason is that while having to have $200 savings to apply to a subsidy of the government, even if they get the water heater, they do not have money to pay the bill for the gas for the water heater. So from day one, with the bathtub, we can, they can get the benefits. With the water heater, they would have to wait until they have money to pay for the bill. And that kind of knowledge, it's for sure uh, better known by families themselves than us. And this is the kind of participation that we ask families. Solve this equation and you're pretty much on the right track. Low rise density, enough to pay for expensive land without overcrowding with possibility of expansion. So with that in mind, we went to prove our point in different locations. Uh, in big cities like Santiago with rain, in this case, roof belongs to the difficult half. In the north, in the desert, no, need, no roof was needed. Going to workshop with families, asking the families uh, to draw what individual intervention of the facades can produce on the future uh, of the neighborhood.
and go and again uh, sloped sides uh, all different type of conditions throughout Chile. With the same approach, we were asked to do a design for the Brad Pitt's Make It Right Foundation for New Orleans. And again, the approach of, in this case, for the new set of constraints, but still identify the first difficult half of a house so that then families can adapt that. In the case of New Orleans, it's a, a second house that used to perform as a family income, the ori originally before the disaster, two households were in there and normally the second ha half was, the second house was to, either to accommodate relatives or to rent it out and use the same house as an uh, income generation. For the first moment, it can be used as an outdoor space that is particularly appropriate for the New Orleans uh, weather. And this is the first housing, social housing project we've built outside Chile in Mexico. And uh, I think this is the best project we've done so far. So again, a process of self-improvement uh, has been happening uh, over six years or so. The best thing about this project is that these are $20,000 units. In Mexico, it's, it's very brutal. It's pure market. There's no aid unless there's a World Bank specific credit to some project. It's pure market. And the, the most economic unit, the market it's providing, it's around $30,000, $35,000. So these units are $20,000. But because of the density without overcrowding we achieved, we were able to buy land in a neighborhood where households cost uh, value is about $50,000. And again, that is ex expressing how important location for the poor will be in the future. So the thing is, can we do all this quick and massive? We've been developing some uh, building system, prefabricated houses, which uh, uh, you have to know the, the biggest criticism to prefabrication, uh, that is, uh, because of the nature of the system and because of economy of means, it tends to repeat all the solutions. So it's unable to accommodate the diversity of different families, different preferences, structures, uh, house, um, running a shop at home or whatever. But in this case, in the problem of not having enough money was the solution. We are not prefabricating a house. We are prefabricating half of a house. So the second half, the more repetitive and monotonous, which is great for the building system, the more we're going to be able to accommodate second halves that are going to be customizing that initial monotonous, boring half. So, <clears throat> what about here? This is, I, I ran out of battery of, of my, my camera of the, on the phone on the way to the airport, so, so I had to go to the internet to look at some, because I saw some experiences uh, which looked like this, like uh, boxes, one close to the other, uh, with a gap in between, uh, more or less something like that. And I'm just guessing it might be about 35, 40 square meters or something. And of course this is not, big enough, and what I saw from the, from the road too, was the second required half of the fa fa families is happening in an extremely inefficient way in the backyard. At least this one's unlike in the case of Mexico where this thing is in the back, at least this one is in the front, assuming that this is the street. The second half, it's very inefficient in the sense that for achieving a new room, you have to build five of the six faces that rooms need, floor, three walls, and the roof. And of course, the problem of the partition wall, you can't expect neighbors to perform in a good way while doing structure for those shared walls. Uh, and this is exactly the same problem we found in Chile, we found in Mexico, we've been founding in Brazil and in Angola. It's amazing how fast by bad ideas travel. <laughs> so, for example, Thank you. 
this is an exercise we did two or three years ago for the 2006 new policy in Chile, and it's exactly the same thing in here. So that was, what was announced by the government at that time was, well, if that was the old house, now we're doing better, we're going to give you this one. Uh, take a look at the size of living room and dining room, two bedrooms, kitchen, bathroom. Uh, so our proposal at the time was, why don't you take the same unit that you're giving this one, but do it in that way? The same amount of square meters, just in two stories, in the front of the lot, in such a way that with the structure of this box and the one of this one, you're creating a void in here that would have already the structure so that then infill will happen in between. Like this. If it's the case, put a roof because it's a difficult thing to achieve. And then allow the second half to grow in between the voids because that will leave space behind. And if families want to go even farther into that direction, they can achieve a really big household, still having a front that has more urban quality, that has a direct impact on value gain for the future. So somehow we're trying to be strategic with our half, try to identify all those things that require coordination. The scarcest resource in here is not money, is coordination. So infrastructure is the type of operations that you normally do when high levels of coordinations are required, like in this case. If we're not able to identify that strategic first half, it's not that people will not come to cities. They will come anyway to cities but they will come in this way. And that is already happening. It's not because we're not finding a solution that, okay, people are going to stay on the countryside. They're, they're looking for opportunities, and those opportunities are in the cities. So somehow, what we're trying to do, and I would just to clarify a final remark, this by no means is a kind of moral or ethical thing that requires professional charity. This is a difficult, massive question that requires professional quality. Because if so, we're going to be using that energy, add it to that energy, and hopefully we get that type of thing. Thank you so much. <laughs>